Today, something showed up in the mail from an audio gear manufacturer. In this case, it was Slate Digital who sent me some of their modeling mics. In this case, it was the ML1 and three of the ML2s. Now, I was always under the impression that modeling mics required their own proprietary mic pre. Slate Digital has their VMS1, but they said I could use any mic pre that wasn't adding too much color. Now, I've always been kind of skeptical of modeling mics, and I guess that's because I've been lucky enough to work in some of the best studios in the world with some of the best microphones around, and I've got a pretty good mic collection here, which I spent a lot of money on, and that brings me to the next thing. These mics are pretty inexpensive. This is about 150 bucks. This is around $800. I just don't see how they're going to replace or emulate expensive mics. I just don't believe it, but I figured I got them. Let's try them out. The next few weeks were going to be filled with recording various clients as well as my own music. So I figured I'd go ahead and set up the Slate digital mics as well as some of my mics together. And later on, I'd compare them in a video like this one. But as usual, I kind of overdid it. I ended up with a really huge amount of footage of me just recording all these different microphones. And then I spent a whole day filming myself trying out all the different mics and all the different models and comparing them to my microphones, thinking I was gonna put together this amazing comparison video. But in the end, as I started to edit it, it was just a cluster. I need to get some sleep. So I wasn't able to make the scientific kind of comparison video I thought I was gonna make, but I did get to use these mics in a lot of different situations and I used all the mic models and I found out a few useful and interesting things. So here we go. The way these mics work is you record them in like any mic and then you use one of the mic model collections inside of the virtual rack plugin. Most of these are made for the ML1 mic, the classic instruments mic collection being the only one that's made specifically for the ML2, although I've been using them interchangeably on both mics. The first thing I wanted to try these mics on is this acoustic guitar part for a song of mine called Poison. I recorded it using the Slate Digital ML1, my Magic U87, the Slate ML2, and my Josephson C42, which is a copy of the Neumann KM184. Before I tried out any of the mic modeling plugins, I wanted to see what the Slate mic sounded like compared to my other mics without any of the software being used on them. As I usually do, I doubled all the acoustic guitar parts. Well, obviously the Neumann has that beautiful high end to it and the richness in its lower mids, but the ML1 didn't sound bad. Now the ML2 and the Josephsons compared to each other, man, they sound almost exactly the same. And those Josephsons are over 500 bucks each. So it was kind of like a bit of a surprise. Next, I wanted to dig into the different mic models. I wanted to see how close I could get the ML1 to sound like my U87. So I brought up the classic 87 mic collection. Here's my U87. Now the ML1. U87. Pretty close. I tried the other two models in this collection, the Mark I and the Mark II, but I didn't like them as much. And even though the AI model makes it sound even more like my U87, there's still something a little bit too subtle about it. Maybe I'm looking more for vibe than emulation. So I went through the classic tubes collection and ended up on the FG251. Definitely stands up to the U87, but it's a different sound. Not bad, but I still wanted something with a bit more vibe to it. I had just installed the Strong Room London mic collection and I was like, whoa, each one of these mics has an obvious personality. Especially this Coles. It definitely makes it sound more like a ribbon mic. The SD47, yeah. The SD47 makes that mid-range glow. And it stands out in the mix. 
Now, while the Josephson C42s have a little extra sparkle on the top end, they don't sound that different from the ML2s. So I figured I'd try some of the small diaphragm condenser models from the classic instruments mic collection, and I ended up on the S451 model. Without it. With it. Now while it did add that sheen on the top end that picks up the detail of the pick hitting the strings, and it makes it sound more like the Josephson's, it was still a subtle difference. And I'm not one for subtleties. I wanted to hear more extreme differences. So I started checking out all the different models of mics from this collection, including the ones you wouldn't normally use on acoustic guitar. And here's what I found. There's a bigger difference in the different models than there are in some of the other collections. For instance, here's the 451 we've been listening to. Now here's the Royer 121. I'm gonna come down here to the, the drum mics. Check out this kick mic. It's got that scooped mid-range. I wouldn't necessarily use that on an acoustic guitar, but if I had a really muddy acoustic guitar, maybe I'd put that on there. But here's the thing that was really interesting to me is the custom 57 snare mic model. I really like that. Here it is with it. Without it. I don't know, it's cool. It's got a nice presence. I, I really like that. If I go to the Tom mic. I, that's a bit of a surprise. That's a really cool damn sound. And I like it better than these other 57s up here but this custom snare. I'm gonna come back to that for acoustic guitars. I really dig that a lot. Next, I worked on mandolin parts for my song, Long Distance Runner. I mic'd it using the Slate Digital ML2, a Shure SM57, and a Josephson C42. Unlike the previous song where I had recorded all the mics through the same internal mic prees on my interface using no compression, in an attempt to be scientific about it, this time I recorded the SM57 and the C42 the way I normally do, through my Cappy mic prees and my Distressor compressors. This would give me a chance to see how the Slate Distressor and mic pre models stand up to the real thing. Later going back and listening to it, I thought, Demo 2 sounds pretty cool. The Josephson's sound a little too bright and polite for me, which is why I never use small diaphragm condensers on a mandolin. So I'm gonna put that to the side. The 57 sounds like a 57. So here we've got their vintage 57 on the ML2. Let's try some different ones. Here's the uh, S7. Yeah, it's all right. 421. It's cool. Scoops out a little mid-range there. Yeah, that's all right. There's the 112, the 112B. I actually like this one here, the S12. I'm not sure exactly what that's supposed to be modeling. Let's hear that in the mix. Here it is without it. With it. I like that one. Let's try some other ones. Probably not gonna like the Royers because I want something with a little more aggressiveness to it. The 47 is pretty cool. But I'm gonna go down here and try this custom snare 57 again. I like that. Here it is with it. Without it. Oh yeah, I like that one a lot. All right, I wanna try something here. Even though the Strong Room collection is not made for the ML2, it's made for the ML1, I just wanna try it out because I really do like the uh, 47 that they've got in there. I'm gonna turn up the intensity a little bit. Without it, with it, not blown away by it like I was on the acoustics, but it's pretty cool. 
gonna go back to the 57. Oh, I do like that 57. Let's see how it compares to an actual 57. It's cool. ML2. I think I like the ML2 better. It's doing something in there that's pretty dang cool. I'm, I'm digging that. Gotta say, it's pretty cool. Next, I recorded my vocals using the ML1. And then I doubled them. And then I recorded them all again using a Norman U87. And I doubled all of those as well. Then I did two tracks of my backing vocals on the ML1. And then did that again on the U87. Here's the ML1. But you're on again. U87. Lay down the load. Okay. Oh, let it go. ML1. Oh, let it go. Okay. Those sound very similar. Obviously, there's a difference. The Neumann has a little bit more high end, but they sound very, very similar. It's like, come on, man. Is this an $800 mic? This is kind of a lot of money, but it sounds really close. It's, uh, you know, it's actually a little heavier. Maybe, maybe that has something to do with it. It's, it's a heavy mic. I figured I'd give another shot at trying out the Classic 87 collection. Oh, and I should add that I've got the plugins on all of the stacked vocals groups so that when I change the settings on one of them, it's changing it on all of them. You're my runner. You're so here's the runner. Mark 1. You're here's the Mark runner. 2. You know, it's, it's cool. Here it is with it. You're my runner. Without it. With it. it just doesn't do much to me. I, I think I actually like it better without it. But I love the high end of the FG800 from the Classic Tubes collection. I also really like the FG251. It is without it. And now back in. So of course I moved on to the SD47. Here it is without it. It is with it. Nice. I love what this thing does. It is with it. Just let it go. Without it. Yeah, man, this, this thing just does something cool. It's like with the presence and there's a warmth and there's this magic to this mic model I really love. This one's, that's it. Then I had this idea. I decided that I should add some pad vocals, which of course I did on the ML1 and the U87. But listening back to them, once again, they sounded very similar. But the thing that's interesting about both of them is that whenever I do these kind of ooze, there's always like this kind of weird distortion in the lower notes and in the low end of my voice that I hear on both mics. You hear that? I don't know where that comes from. It must be in my throat. And normally the way I would deal with that is to put a Pro Q3 on there and just do this dynamic EQ thing, kind of push that down some. But I thought, you know what? What if I think of this more as an EQ? So I pulled up this mic here which definitely, I noticed, had a scoop sound to it. So I could definitely change the sound. Check it out. Here it is with it. And with that out, it totally sucks out that lower mid-range. So in the mix, and without it, ah, it's cool. It's cool. It's actually like EQing it for me, which I think is really damn cool. Then I had this other idea. I wanted to add some call and response vocals to the second verse. I decided to use the ML2 because all the other vocals were done with a large diaphragm condenser microphone and I wanted something that would sound a bit different from the other vocals. Plus, I've never used a small diaphragm condenser mic on vocals before. 
I started by putting it through this compressor here, the distressor, but with the Distortion 3 mode on, which emulates hitting tape really hard. Because I really want it to sound like I'm just screaming, which I was. It still wasn't quite enough, so I thought, well, let me try some of these mic models. See if I can drive them hard. It's cool, like the 47. You know, I went through a bunch of these, and none of them seemed like they were really hitting it hard enough. And then I thought about how when starting to use these mics, I read the instructions, they're talking about doing these really lower recording levels. And I typically record pretty hot, and I really wanted this to sound like I was just screaming. So I ended up doing this. I put a trimmer on here, and I thought, let me just crank it up and just sound like I'm just overdriving the freaking mic. Let me just hit the mic really hard. So I did this. I went through a bunch of these. 57. Turned up the proximity here a little bit. I mean, they're all kind of cool, but I think what I ended up coming to was the uh, Royer 121. There it is with it. Without it. And then with it. Definitely fluffing it up some. Then I thought I'd try out some of the uh, classic tube mics. Even though they're not made for the ML2, I thought, what the hell, do it anyway. Went through a bunch of these. But I ended up on this one here, which I've not liked so far. There's without it. Now with it. Yeah, it's, like, it's got that funky, weird lower mid-range, like I'm just up on the mic and overdriving everything. I also, of course, like the 47. Just abusing it, basically. And then I thought, oh, the hell with it. Let's turn them all on. So now we've got uh, all three of these on at the same time. What the hell? Why not? I just wanted to sound like I'm just screwing it all up, you know? So I ended up with this. With all three of them on, the trimmer and the compressor. Just make it sound, I don't know. Yeah, why not? Put them all on. I also tried out the ML2s while recording drums for the group Sky Blue Sky. I set up an ML2 next to my normal snare mic, a Shure SM57. This is drummer Seth Hendershot playing drums. So here's the SM57. Here's the ML2. A little thinner, not as poppy as the 57. Here's the 57 again. Yeah, it definitely sounds like a small diaphragm condenser microphone. I put a trimmer plug in on here to match the level while A being. Here's a modern 57 model. It definitely makes it punchier. It stands up to the 57 a little better. Without it. With it. Try out some of the other models. They're cool. Some a little weird. I like the RE20's thickness. And actually like the 112's poppy punchiness. I'm gonna try out these Royers. Without it. With it. Not bad. Without it. With it. But the main thing was the custom snare. There's the real SM57. There's the ML2. 57. Now with a kit. 57. ML2. Not exactly like a 57, but pretty cool, and I like all the choices on the different mic models. I also set up a pair of MO2s as brew mics, along with a pair of Neumann TLM 103s, about 12 feet from the drums. Now, I do have the room mics up a little bit, just so you can really hear the differences. Here's the TLM 103s. All right. Here's the MO2s. Not quite as thick. 
I'm running distressor compressors on both of the pairs. Here it is without compression. Now back in. Here's the MO2 soloed. I tried some different models. But what I was really going for were the 121 models. Here it is with Adam. And then back in. Here's the dynamic model. Now with the rest of the kit. 121's off. Back on. Definitely makes it punchier. Here's the TLM 103 room mics. Now back to the ML2s. Cool. But I also wanted to see what the Strong Room London collection sounded like. Here's the 4038. A little less intensity. Without him. Back on. Back to the 121. I thought I'd check out some of the other strong room models. Here's the 414 EB, the 414 BU, the 47, nap, the 12 VR. Now back to the TLM 103s. Here's the ML2s with a 121 model. I like that. Not bad. Next, I needed to record some guitar parts for a song called As Long As I'm With You for one of my favorite artists to work with, Zach Cooper. Now, Zach pretty much lets me do my thing, so I did, which was to set up a lot of mics, use different guitars, and experiment with new sounds. All of which I filmed, but it was too much for this one video. So I decided to focus on this one part, but I have three different guitar parts here with, what, six different mics on each part. But here, I'll just go through them real quick. So here's the ML1. It wasn't until the end of filming this section that I just realized I am on the ML2, okay? In Pro Tools, I titled it as an ML1, I just realized. I'm using the ML2. Yeah, this mic. Been using this one. Not this one. I need to get some sleep. So when I say ML1, I actually mean ML2. 57, Sennheiser 409. This old EV mic I've got, Sennheiser 421. And then on the other part, I've got an ML1. 57, Sennheiser 409, <laughs> an EV, Sennheiser 421. I'm gonna skip this 414, that's part of an experiment I don't even wanna get into right now. They all sound good, and it's like, oh wait, how do I even start to like, to show you, I don't know how to compare them. But anyway, I got an idea here. So what I'm gonna do here is just focus on the ML1 and not do so much comparison with all the other mics. It's just focus on what this thing does. Now, I've got a trimmer plug-in on here so that when I'm bypassing it and turning it back on, the volume doesn't jump too much. So right here, we're on the 57 Vintage. Modern. SM7. 421. And right off the bat, what I'm noticing is finally I'm hearing these different models shine on this mic. I don't know if it's because it's a guitar or what it is exactly, but here, let me solo up the guitar here. Like, just listen, you can really hear the difference between all the mics. The Royer beefs it up nicely. There it is with the Royer, without it. Gives it some beef. And then, of course, down here, I'm gonna skip a couple of these. The custom snare 57 is cool. Without it. Yeah, I really hear a lot more of a difference using it on this guitar than I was on vocals or anything else. I don't know, I like the 57. I like those. 
kind of also like the uh, the Royer is cool. Just gives it this like thick, like I'm gonna punch your fucking face in sort of thing, you know? I really like that. And man, I've, I've never actually mic'd a guitar amp with a small diaphragm condenser before. That's kind of what was weird about this whole thing is like, really? I'm gonna mic an amp with a small diaphragm condenser and it's supposed to sound like a fucking ribbon mic? You gotta be kidding me. But I put it on as like, that's pretty cool. Anyway, kind of like this, uh, I don't know, I kind of like, I like a lot of these. Actually, I kind of like this 112B on here. There it is with it. Do that. It. That's pretty fucking cool. So now I'm gonna move on to the second guitar part in this section, which is kind of like a harmony. So here it is with the 57 on it. It's the right guitar. Some seven. That's pretty cool. I like that. I like that buzzy on the top. That's all right. Not liking the. 12 on this part as much. No, I like that 112 B a lot. No, I do like the Royer on here. There it is with it. Without it. Custom snare on that. Let's solo these up. There it is with a custom 57 on it. Now without it. That one works in so many situations that I've tried out so far. So it's either that or the went to a B. Back to the custom snare. Oh, I like that one. It does something. The lower mid, I like. Back into the mix. Bring it down a little bit. I wanted to try a model on the actual 57 that I've got here. I think it's classic too. This guy here. See what that sounded like. The 44. Without it. That's pretty damn cool. That's on the 57, the actual SM57. Put it back in the mix. I don't know. It beefs up this like punchy area in it. I don't know. It's like, this is so many choices here. I don't know. I could get lost in this crap. But let me go back to the ML1 here. Or the ML2. I'm calling this an ML1 through this. I just realized. And that's pretty much where it all ended. So after going through all that, the question is, do I think these mics sound exactly like the models that they're emulating? Nah, but they get really damn close and they're very affordable. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be using these on some future projects. I just, oh, wait a sec. Do I got to return these things? It's kind of hoping that it could be kind of. Achoo!